Welcome to another video on this channel, The Proof is in the Puzzles. Every week we'll be solving a jigsaw puzzle and discussing either a court case, conspiracy theory, news story, or really anything else interesting that we come across. For this week, we will be solving this 1000 piece puzzle from Buffalo Games. This is a painting from Chuck Pinson titled A Moment on Memory Lane. It's got some really nice fall vibes going on and there's some classic cars, some dogs, some houses, some trees, pretty much everything you would want in a nice fall painting. As for the topic of discussion for today, I thought it would be interesting to look at Malaysian Flight 370 since the 10th anniversary of the events that transpired was earlier this month. So without further ado, let's hop into the video. On March 8, 2014, a routine international flight, flight MH370 from the Kuala Lumpur International Airport in Malaysia, was slated to depart just after midnight local time and arrive six hours later in the Beijing Capital International Airport in China. After departing at 12.42, everything about the Malaysian 370 flight appeared to be normal. Communication was established between air traffic control and the pilot. Altitudes, positions, and total remaining fuel were also reported. By all signs, this seemed like any other ordinary flight. But this was no ordinary flight. At 1.19, the pilot signaled air traffic control and gave them the following message. Good night, Malaysian 370. Unbeknownst to air traffic control, this would be the last they would hear from the pilot. Just a minute later, the plane disappeared from air traffic control's secondary radar screens and abruptly turned in a southwesterly direction, almost directly in the opposite direction of the target destination. After losing the plane on the secondary radar screens, however, the Malaysian military's primary radar was still able to track the flight for another hour until the plane flew out of radar range at 2.22. In the month following the plane's mysterious disappearance, a search and rescue team headed by the Australian government was assembled in hopes of finding any remaining survivors. Targeted initially at the South China Sea, but changed to the Southern Indian Ocean after further analysis, the search lasted almost two months and covered a total of 1.8 million square miles of ocean. Unfortunately, the search and rescue team came up empty and as a result, all 227 passengers and 12 crew members were presumed dead, making this one of the deadliest aircraft incidents in aviation history. Knowing they would need a much larger and lengthier underwater search, rather than the surface search they had already conducted, in October of 2014, the Australian government, with the assistance of Malaysia and China, set off to lead the largest investigation in aviation history. The search lasted two and a half years and cost an estimated $155 million. Unfortunately, this search only uncovered three confirmed pieces from Flight 370, with another five pieces that were considered highly likely from the plane, although were not confirmed. Following the search, the Australian government described that it was inconceivable for a large commercial aircraft to be missing and for the world not to know with certainty what became of the aircraft and those on board. Another six-month search was conducted a year after this lengthy search, also to no avail. In total, 120,000 square miles of seafloor were searched, with little to show for it. Part of the reason the search was so difficult is that the area where the plane crashed is renowned for its strong winds, inhospitable climate, hostile seas, and deep ocean floors. So how did an ordinary and routine flight end in such a catastrophic manner? Well, there have been a lot of theories regarding this case, but there are three in particular I want to explore a little more into. First theory is that the plane was hijacked by terrorists. The second is that the pilot intentionally downed the plane in a tragic murder-suicide. And third, merely natural circumstances were the cause, such as a fire or a sudden drop in cabin pressure. The first theory we'll look into is a potential terrorist attack. One reason this theory gained traction was because there were two Iranian passengers traveling under fake passports on the flight. Later investigation concluded, however, that these two men weren't linked to any terrorist organizations and were likely asylum seekers. Another reason for this theory is the peculiar behavior of the Satellite Data Unit, or SDU, on the plane. This device allows air-to-ground communication via a satellite network and is an integral part of the SATCOM system as a whole. The interesting thing that happened with this device is that I was offline at some point from 107 to 203 and came back online at 225 just minutes after the plane was outside the reach of primary radar. So you might be wondering, how does the SDU go offline, then come back online? It seems the likely explanation is human intervention. There seems to be decent evidence that without human intervention, it's not feasible for the SDU to turn off, then on again. So if a human did turn off the SDU, why might this indicate a terrorist attack? 
The main reason this might be the work of a terrorist, and not the pilot or another crew member, is that technically speaking, the SDU is not the easiest device to turn on and off, it is not something a typical pilot would know how to do. This would then indicate that someone with a certain level of technical savvy, other than the pilot, such as a terrorist, could be at fault. So although the two men mentioned earlier might not be the terrorists, the peculiar behavior of the SDU still might indicate that this was the work of a terrorist. Another popular theory is that the pilot was to blame for the plane's disappearance. Similar to the terrorist theory, there is reasonable evidence that someone on the plane was to blame for the plane's sudden turnaround and eventual disappearance. So naturally, if it wasn't a terrorist, the blame would then fall on the pilot. The main evidence for this theory is the findings of a search of the pilot's home flight simulator. About one month before the 370 flight, the pilot of the flight, Captain Zahari Ahmad Shah, simulated a similar flight path to the one taken on the night of the disappearance. As stated by the Australian Transport Safety Bureau, or ATSB, which was corroborated by similar findings by the FBI, the simulation had, quote, enough similarities to the flight path of MH370 for the ATSB to carefully consider the possible implications for the underwater search area. This meant that the organizations involved in investigating the plane's disappearance believed the home simulation run by the pilot a month earlier was close enough to the actual path taken that they decided to use it to help narrow down their search area. Thus, it's very possible that this disappearance was no accident and that the pilot had actually planned the exact path and led him, his crew, and the passengers on board to their doom. As a counterpoint to this theory, however, it seems that the pilot had another similar flight only two days after the simulation in question, so it's also very possible he was simulating that first flight rather than the Malaysian 370 flight. The third popular theory is that the plane disappeared due to natural causes, such as a fire or sudden drop in cabin pressure. There are two convincing pieces of evidence to support this claim. One is the sudden turnaround after comms went out. This could indicate that something was severely malfunctioning and that the pilot turned around the plane to try and fly to the nearest suitable airport to fix the problem. The other piece of evidence is that the plane was likely on autopilot, which could indicate that the plane wasn't being deliberately controlled by a human and thus potentially disputing the first two theories that human intervention was to blame. The likelihood of the plane being on autopilot was evidenced first by the fact that the plane didn't have significant deviations from its path, and second, an analysis of damage on some of the recovered wreckage indicated the plane crashed while on autopilot. The main rebuttal to this theory, however, is that neither the crew nor the aircraft's communication systems relayed any distress signals, the weather that night was clear with no rain or lightning nearby, and there were no indications of technical problems before the aircraft vanished off the radar. So whether the disappearance of Malaysian Flight 370 was a terrorist attack, a murder-suicide plot carried out by the pilot, an act of God, or a black hole, one thing remains clear. We may never know what happened to Malaysian Flight 370. Comment below what you think happened to Malaysian Flight 370 or any other stories you want me to cover. And make sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and want to see more content like it. Thanks.